Following a well-established protocol, Ryan Parr and his team at the Paleo DNA Lab take over the bone sample, while Dr. Molto conducts an independent analysis of the three teeth also found in the grave. Equipped with the latest technology, the scientists will try and extract the unknown child's nearly century-old DNA. But getting viable DNA from this little sample is not going to be easy. The sample that I began to analyze is a pretty tough little sample. It's, it's one of the worst samples in terms of preservation I've ever seen. Preservation isn't the only concern. The team must guard against even the smallest trace of contamination. Before handling the bone, Dr. Carney Matheson dons a clean suit, enters a sealed chamber. An air shower sweeps off any particles that might corrupt the data. Tiny flakes are scraped from the arm bone and soaked in a solution of enzymes that liberate fragmented sequences of DNA. These fragments are then copied and loaded into a gel. Electricity directed through the tray will sort the DNA by size. We run it to the lower voltage for better resolution. Well, we'll see how it goes to start off with. I mean, that, that will give us better resolution, which should probably be good. After just a few hours, they get the data they were hoping for. From a weathered bit of bone, they've successfully pieced together the genetic fingerprint of a child dead for 90 years. Now they have a chance to identify it. This is 16210 to 16401. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. That's the most reliable one we've got. So, I mean, we'll sequence that, check it out with the other one. The Excellent. Other team. Excellent. Yeah. It's amazing the bone actually survived it at all. So, to bring alive this, this individual from such a small fragment that basically is non existent is really amazing. And to get the DNA from that is really exciting. For almost 100 years, Legend has linked the unknown child to Justa Polson. Ryan Parr and his team are about to prove whether they are, in fact, the same person. So this is the unknown child's bone sample. It's a pretty good, you know, pretty good sequence there. We've got uh, 16210 to 16401. We'll pull up the John Highland sequence, and then we'll see what uh, what happens here. So, so we're going to compare them, yeah, letter to letter. But almost immediately. Our spots a problem. Okay, so if we look right here, right away, we can see that there is a difference. And, yeah. Um, so down here, when we look at this sequence, we can see that there are actually three differences. Shattering everyone's expectations, the letters that spell out the biochemical family names of John Highland, the unknown child, do not match. According to this data, um, the unknown child um, is not related to John Highland which means that it is not close to Leonard Folsom. Remains unknown. Remains unknown at this point. Yeah. In Sweden, Justa's relatives await Parr's report. Hello, Ryan. It's Lotte from Sweden. Do you have some information for me? So, uh, do you have any idea who it could be? Okay, Ryan. Well, it was not good news for us, but uh, I was speaking to Ola yesterday, and we said that we uh, want to give the unknown child a name, and we don't care if it is just or somebody else. He wants an identity of the child, so we can rest in peace. So. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Ola and Lars Inge break the news to John Hyland and his granddaughter, Sarah. Though it isn't what they'd hoped, the family has gained an understanding and acceptance of Justa's final fate. There was a possibility that it could be my grandfather's cousin, but it's not, and therefore he's resting at the bottom of the sea, which is okay. We wish Ryan Paul good luck to find who, yeah. who it really is. But he uh, told me to tell you, John, you have beautiful DNA, he said. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but he wasn't right. He 
In Ontario, Canada, the DNA team reconsiders its options. Though it wasn't used to Polson, they've still succeeded in finding the child's genetic fingerprint, and no one is ready to give up. We know that the signature of the unknown child is, is really robust. We really have a big tool to, um, to continue the hunt and the detective work for who yeah. the unknown child may be. To redirect their search, the scientists review one last piece of evidence. The results are in on the three teeth examined by Dr. Molto. They were baby teeth, and the caps are just forming. And it was my feeling that, in fact, this uh, person was no older than a year. Molto's findings reconfirm that two-year-old Justa Polson could not be the unknown child. It's time to start looking for candidates less than a year old. Ruffman returns to the archives to scour the passenger list and finds two infants who fit the new profile. Seven-month-old Edward Peacock from England and four-month-old Gilbert Danbaum from Sweden. After more genealogical sleuthing, living relatives are traced, blood is drawn, and DNA sequences are generated. But when they compare the sequences to that of the unknown child, Parr and his team still get no match. Determined to carry on, they shift their investigation to three slightly older children. The first is 13-month-old Eno, the youngest son of Finnish passenger Maria Panela. Working backwards to the family tree, Alan Ruffman locates Eno's living relatives. It just has stuck in my mind the strange fact that a relative of mine died in that incident. And I've been many times thinking of how tragic an event that really was. Like Alma Paulson, Maria Panela was traveling in third class with her children, en route to join husband Juho in America. The family came from Iliherma, a rural farming community in western Finland. In the early years of the century, life was so much more difficult for them here in Finland, and like so many others, they too wanted to emigrate. There were many rumors that life was much easier over there in America. But it was not to be. Maria Panela and her five sons were among the 1,523 victims of the Titanic. Traveling alone, 18-year-old Anna Turia, another Finnish passenger, survived the wreck and remembered Maria's panicked cry, do we all have to die by water? Just a year before, the Panela's nine-year-old daughter, Emma, had drowned in a river back home. Now, her mother and brothers confronted the same fate. In the chaos, Maria was separated from her older boys. The night when this tragedy happened and the Titanic went down, my mother told me that Maria had been desperately looking for her children. When the panic started, she was looking for them on the deck. She was offered a place in the lifeboat. There was room for her and her youngest, little Ana. But she refused, as another lady told her she had seen the boys. Then Maria's sons found their mother. She could have claimed her seat in the boat, but the three oldest clung to their mother's feet, saying, Mom, please don't leave us. So she couldn't leave them. I would do the same thing in those circumstances, saving only yourself and your youngest one and leaving the others there to drown. No, I couldn't do that, ever. According to the records, the bodies of Maria Panela and her five sons were never recovered. But maybe the youngest, little Eno, was found by the men of the Mackey Bennett. Could he be the unknown child? Magda and three other relatives of Eno Panela send their blood to Ryan Parr. Four years after the Titanic identification project began, the team finally gets its match. After 90 years without a name, the unknown child's identity has at last been restored. Now Magda and her family are traveling all the way to Halifax, Nova Scotia, 
to visit the grave of their long-lost relative. Alan Ruffman is on hand to accompany them to the cemetery. <laughs> so, so nice to see you. Oh, I'm delighted to meet you. I feel I know you very well because I know your family history. Yes, no better than Yes, I think so. <laughs> Brian Parr has also made the journey. As have Magda's son-in-law, Yurki, daughter Nina, and granddaughter, Tia, who is just a few months older than Aino Pamela was at the time of his death. Here, they didn't put this on the grave. And uh, this is a stone that was made by the man of the Mackey Pennis. Erected to the memory of an unknown child whose remains were recovered after the disaster to the Titanic, April the 15th, 1912. Beautiful gesture from those sailors to raise this monument for the child. I can't find the watch. I couldn't know that I how much this that means for me. Year after year citizens of Halifax still honor the memory of their adopted son, covering the ground around his monument with gifts. It moves me that people care, yes. People care still after nearly 100 years. It's very touching. I feel very satisfied and, and comforted and relieved that the child has, has been identified because um, it, was, it was one of those things that sort of seems like it was, it, it was meant to be. Like um, the unknown child really does um, deserve a name, and now he has that name. Yes, that's good. You see, he has a name now. Aino William Ipano. That's the name. Aino Ipano. Rest in peace.